This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. There are various things we all know about Nietzsche. We know that central to his philosophy was the idea of the Ubermensch or Superman, a vision of future man who's escaped from the shackles of Christian morality. We know that Nietzsche was an anti Semite who targeted both Jews and Judaism. And we know, too, that he was the father of postmodernism and fatally undermined the idea that there's universal truth. We know all that, right? Except, as leading Nietzsche scholar Brian Leiter of the University of Chicago points out, that's all baloney. Brian Leiter, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about Nietzsche, but specifically myths about Nietzsche. Let's start with perhaps the most famous idea from Nietzsche that what he really was about was the ubermensch, the overman or superman. Well, it's certainly true that the image of the ubermensch, the superman, the overman, has dominated popular perception of Nietzsche for a very long time now. The funny thing is, and people who haven't read Nietzsche carefully don't know this, the image of the overman appears in only one book, in Nietzsche's entire corpus, right? And Nietzsche wrote, depending exactly on what you count as a book, a dozen or so books, but there's only one from the early 1880s, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in which this image of the Ubermensch, the overman, figures very centrally. So that should immediately raise our antennae, (laughs) that something funny is going on here. If it's so important to Nietzsche, this idea of the Ubermensch, why does he never talk about it except in this one book? And then if we return to Zarathustra itself, we can see why this image might have played such a large role in that book in particular. So Zarathustra is written in, shall we say, a colorful way, an unusual style for a philosophical work. And the most obvious reason for that is because fundamentally Zarathustra is a parody. It is a parody of the New Testament, and Zarathustra is a parody of the Christ figure. And so as a parody of the Christ figure, Zarathustra has to have certain teachings. And one of his teachings is, lo and behold, this strange creature called the Ubermensch. But once Nietzsche is done with Zarathustra and his anti-Christian teachings, he's also, as far as I can tell, done with this idea of the Ubermensch. So are you saying Nietzsche doesn't endorse the idea that we should create this person in the future who surpasses everything that is now human? I think that's exactly right. Nietzsche certainly thinks that there are higher human beings and lesser human beings. And sad to say, Nietzsche thinks most of us are lesser human beings, but there are a handful of higher human beings. But they aren't unattainable. They aren't unrealizable. They aren't some ideal that's lurking in the future. If you look through the Nietzschean corpus at the people that Nietzsche thinks are just exemplary human beings, models of successful human lives. Goethe looms larger than anyone else. Beethoven is way up there. Nietzsche, in a funny way, is also way up there as well. So they're clearly not these unattainable ideals of the kind that Zarathustra is always talking about in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So why do you think so many people believe the Ubermensch to be at the core of Nietzsche's teaching? I think there are a couple of explanations. One certainly has to do with the fact that Thus Spoke Zarathustra became a very important book in the early reception of Nietzsche. As you may know, the Kaiser in World War I issued copies of Zarathustra to all the German soldiers. By the early 1900s, Nietzsche was the most important figure in German and probably in European intellectual life. So everybody wanted a piece of Nietzsche, and not just the Kaiser. There were the anarchist Nietzsches, the socialist Nietzsches, there were even the sort of proto-feminist Nietzsches. Everybody wanted a piece of Nietzsche at that time. So Zarathustra, because it was given this important prominence, because it's really his most literary work, probably got a bigger audience than it may have deserved. Now, Nietzsche himself seemed to think it was his greatest work. I think it's fair to say Nietzsche was mistaken in in that regard. So that had something to do with it. I think the other explanation, of course, is tied to the unhappy history between Nietzsche and the Nazis. Nietzsche's sister, who was a proto-Nazi German nationalist anti-Semite, used her role as literary executor after Nietzsche's mental collapse in 1889 to repackage 
Nietzsche in a way that would make him congenial to the political positions to which he was sympathetic. And the idea of an overman, a superman, something that the Third Reich was going to develop, that probably seemed very attractive. The fact that Nietzsche hated Germans more than anybody else on the face of the earth didn't fit so well with this story, but that's the advantage when you're the literary executor. You can edit out the sections of the books called What the Germans Lack and so on. So there goes the Übermensch, but you've already touched on Nietzsche's alleged anti-Semitism, but is that another myth or was he really an anti-Semite? Well, he certainly wasn't an anti-Semite in any sense of the word I think any of us actually actually use. He clearly did not hate Jews qua Jews. He did not hate Jews qua Jewish people. Indeed, his work has almost an embarrassing set of tributes and praise for individual Jews, for the Jewish people, and so on and so forth. But, and this, of course, is what the Nazi interpreters took advantage of, he was certainly very critical of what he perceived to be the values of Judaism. He was critical of Judaism qua religion, but his single most important complaint about Judaism was that it gave birth to Christianity, which would, of course, make him the strangest anti-Semite in the history of the West. Because what he really objected to about Judaism is that it was responsible for Christianity and Christian values. That was not, <laughs> needless to say, ever been a central theme of anti-Semitism in all its ugly history over the last couple of centuries. Another myth shattered. Let's move on to the will to power. Surely the will to power is at the core of Nietzsche's teaching, isn't it? As with the Ubermensch, that is certainly a widely shared perception of Nietzsche's philosophy. Now, here's something a bit surprising. In his very last work, almost his very last work, Ecce Homo, his very highly stylized autobiography, where he reviews all his prior works, he nowhere assigns an important place to the theme of the will to power. It's mentioned in passing here and there, but it's not treated as the central organizing theme of his philosophy. When, in 1886, he wrote new prefaces to his prior books in which he sort of tried to sum up major themes of his philosophy, will to power is entirely absent. There is a book, as English-speaking readers will know, under the title The Will to Power. It was a concoction. It was a creation by his sister and his literary executor, a man named Peter Gast. And it was a book they put together after his collapse, after his death, and it was a book they put together in direct contravention of what Nietzsche wanted. Because we know that at the very end of his life, Nietzsche decided he did not want to write a book called The Will to Power, because he realized that the will to power was not a central theme of his philosophy. He was interested in the extent to which people were psychologically motivated by a desire for power or for experiences or actions that provoked a feeling of power, but he did not, and he was not committed to the claim that all life is will to power, that all reality is will to power, that will to power is to be an organizing metaphysical principle, as Heidegger claimed, for explaining all of the observable world. What you're saying then is that the psychological desire for power over other people is part of Nietzsche's writings. It's a major concern of his. But the metaphysical theory that reality is simply this seething, controlling drive, that's not there. Okay. I think that's basically right. So some people want to say, well, Nietzsche's idea of will to power is the analog of Schopenhauer's idea of the basic will of, of life. It's the essence of life. And I don't think Nietzsche is, in fact, committed to that particular claim. He is, and he makes use of the psychological hypothesis that people are motivated by the desire for a feeling of power. I wouldn't necessarily equate a feeling of power with control over other people because there are lots of ways to provoke and elicit a feeling of power that don't involve control over other people. Indeed, Nietzsche is very interested in the ways in which control over ourselves, self-control, elicits a feeling of power. But there's all kinds of subtle ways in which the feeling of power, Nietzsche thinks, can be elicited from the, the things we do. So he's interested in it as a psychological hypothesis. He isn't contrary to Heidegger committed to the claim that will to power is the essence of reality, and thus Nietzsche is the culmination of 2,000 years of metaphysics that begins with Plato, which is Heidegger's story about where Nietzsche fits into the history of Western philosophy. It's a complete fiction, as I think even most Heidegger scholars will admit. 
In the last 20 or 30 years, postmodernists have claimed Nietzsche as their guiding philosopher. People like Foucault, Derrida, Paul de Man, these are people who look back to Nietzsche as doing more or less what they've done, but in a kind of prototypical way. Is that right? Well, by now you know what my answer will be. This is yet another myth, and perhaps the most pernicious one that's contributed to Nietzsche's bad reputation among philosophers, since philosophers generally think people like Derrida and de Man are pretty bad philosophers and say a lot of silly and, and foolish things about truth, about meaning, about knowledge, and so on. So if we can separate Nietzsche from this particular myth, we will do him a big favor among academic philosophers. How did Nietzsche get this reputation? Of course, we need to say something about what's at issue in the postmodernist reading. So in the postmodernist reading, Nietzsche is the guy who first appreciates that texts have no meaning. They can mean almost anything that the interpreter wants them to mean. That Nietzsche is a skeptic about truth. There's no such thing as truth. He's a skeptic about knowledge. We can't know the way things really are. There's a certain irony in associating Nietzsche with this idea of skepticism that texts have any meaning, which is that Nietzsche, of course, was trained in the discipline of classical philology, what we now usually call classics in the universities. And classical philology conceived of itself as a Wissenschaft, the German word that usually gets translated as science, though in English it has the unfortunate connotation of natural science, whereas what it really means is a discipline with rigorous methods by which we can elicit certain kinds of knowledge. And Nietzsche throughout his career, and it's very striking if you look carefully at the text, all the way in the very last works, he has a lot of respect for the science of philology, for careful reading, for careful interpretation, for actually sifting through evidence to figure out what texts really mean. This is not the rhetoric of a guy who's a skeptic, who's a Derridian skeptic about whether texts have any meaning. So if that's true, why does anybody take him as their precursor? What's he done to set that up? And that is certainly a fair question. I think the two things have contributed to the perception of Nietzsche as a precursor of postmodernism. One is a very early essay from the early 1870s called On Truth and Lie in an Extra Moral Sense. This was an essay that Nietzsche never published. And this is an important thing to remember about Nietzsche. It's one of the problems with the so-called book, The Will to Power, that his sister put together. Nietzsche wrote his published works by culling them from the notebooks that he was continuously keeping. So when he didn't publish things, you might draw an inference about what he thought about it on reflection. And he never published this essay on truth and lie in an extra moral sense. And it is true that the essay on truth and lie in an extra moral sense seems to sound certain kinds of postmodernist themes. But he didn't publish it, and he didn't return to those particular themes. I think the other aspect of Nietzsche that's lent itself towards the, the postmodernist misappropriation has been the views that travel under the heading of perspectivism. And it is true that if you read what Nietzsche says about perspectivism, and there actually aren't a lot of passages about it, but there are a few, if you read it superficially, it sounds like a certain kind of Protagorean relativism. Man is the measure of all things. There's Nigel's truth, there's Brian's truth, but there is no actual truth. I think if one looks again at those passages with some care, that's not actually their point. They are attacking certain conceptions of what objective truth is, certain conceptions of what it would be to have objective knowledge. They are highly critical of aspects of Kant's views. Again, he's engaged in a certain kind of almost technical philosophical debate, but he's not expressing a generalized skepticism about truth and knowledge. And I think it's important to remember that he couldn't because Nietzsche's entire critique of morality, the revaluation of values, the topic with which he's most centrally concerned throughout his entire life, depends on certain claims about what's true and what Nietzsche knows. Morality falsifies reality. It involves a false picture of what human beings are like. It involves a false picture of human psychology, and on and on and on. None of this would make any sense if Nietzsche were really the proto-postmodernist. Look, if Nietzsche is so prone to be misrepresented, as you've claimed. It can't just be an accident. There must be something about the way he wrote that encouraged people to misread him, as you would have it. I think it's a fair accusation to make against Nietzsche, but let's remember something that Nietzsche often says, which makes him very unusual among philosophers and other writers. Nietzsche is the only major philosopher I can think of who regularly discourages people from reading him. He says, this isn't for everyone. 
It shouldn't be read by just anyone. It requires a great deal of patience and caution, and you need to digest it as the cow digests its cud, and so on. I mean, he's got lots of wonderful images to this effect. And I think he's telling us something important in this regard. There's no doubt that the way he writes lends itself to misunderstandings. It's also true, and we have to remember this, that he's now, of course, this intellectual, cultural, and philosophical icon. And anyone who's a cultural and intellectual and philosophical icon invites appropriations and misappropriations. But I do think that it's important to remember Nietzsche's admonition. Namely, he's got to be read very carefully. He's got to be read with the kind of caution and sensitivity to style, to the literary genre, and to his meanings, which are often surprising meanings, that maybe the average reader isn't ordinarily used to. Nietzsche's attitudes are extremely illiberal. He is not the Enlightenment philosopher who thinks that every person has it within their rational capabilities to realize his ideals, that every person has it within their rational capabilities to understand his true meaning. There's definitely the insiders and the outsiders in, in Nietzsche's vision. Brian Leiter, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.